So good evening, everyone. We'll begin our presentation. So I will begin by telling you a little about me. So I'm, I'm a seventh year medical student, so I'm in my last year. I'm deeply passionate about medicine and dedicated to helping others. And of course, I have some certificates and accomplishments because I like to do a lot of things uh, a part of being a medical student. I like to, uh, I'm a member of uh, Les Randonneurs and I was a former president of the Office of Sports, Arts and Associations at our university. And I have some certificates um, that I did online or in presence by being in uh, some by being in some organizations or in some workshops and then this is our first questions are you ready for this course you can type whatever you want i can't see who is typing it so it's anonymous Okay, so that's good. So our objectives for today's course is uh, to have an introduction of uh, hysterosalpancography, to have a definition, uh, to know the purpose of it, and to know the basic procedure. The second point is to know the clinical relevance and then, of course, we have uh, to have an overview about the indications and contraindications. And, of course, the procedure and techniques, then the safety and risks of it. And we will end it with some case studies. And, of course, at the end, we'll have our take-home message. <clears throat> so the first thing, we will begin with a nice breaker. So there is two truths and one lie in this. So what is the one lie? So the first sentence say that the historical pancography was first performed using a live X-ray television system. And the second one is that MRI machines can also cook popcorn if you set them to the right frequency. And the third one is that the first X-ray ever taken was of a hand with a waiting ring on it. You can answer whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Now just put whatever answer you want to put because we just see numbers here. Yeah, so we have two answers. The lie is that MRI machines can also cook popcorn if you set them to the right frequency. So it's the middle one. The middle one is the, the, the lie. And the first and third one was uh, the truth. Okay. So we will have an initial quiz. What does hysterosal pancography primarily, primarily assess? Does it assess uh, the ovarian function or the uterine cavity and fallopian tube patency or, or the cervical health or the endometrial thickness? You can choose just one answer. Mm, that's an easy one, so... Mm-hmm. Okay, that was good. Okay, so yes, we can see the uterine cavity and fallopian tube patency. Patency is uh, l'impermeabilité des trompes. For those who doesn't know it, l'impermeabilité. <clears throat> 
The second question is, what type of contrast media is commonly used in hysterosal pancography? Is it the gadolinium-based contrast agent, or the barium sulfate, or the water-soluble iodine-based contrast, or the air contrast? Just answer, like we're just having fun here. So just put whatever you want. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So we use water soluble iodine based contrast. <laughs> and then we'll go into the part one. So now we will talk about the basics of hysterosal pancography. So the hysterosal pancography is an X ray procedure used to view the inside of the uterus and fallopian tubes. It's primarily performed for women experiencing infertility. And the procedure involves inserting a cannula through the cervix and injecting a contrast dye to visualize the uterine cavity and tubes on x-ray. So here you can see the, you can see the cannula that is inserted in the cervix cavity and here we have the contracts a uh, contracts uh, medium that we inject and of course after that we have the x-ray to have the final image so now we will have the part two which is the clinical applications so first uh, first thing to do uh, is the ultrasound. I'm talking about the radiological aspects of it. So the first thing to do, if we have a woman that we suspect uh, that, uh, if we have a woman uh, that has infertility, the first exam to do is the ultrasound because it's the first line diagnosis tool. It's a non-invasive examination of reproductive organs, and it's a real-time imaging of uterus and ovaries. Also, it monitors follicle development for ovulation and assess uterine lining thickness and identifies cysts, fibroids, or other anomalies. And it's going to orient us uh, to, uh, to ask for the next examination. We will see why. So the ultrasound is like a window into the womb for initial fertility evaluation. After that, we have the hysterosal pancography and the MRI. The hysterosal pancography is a key for detecting blocked fallopian tubes, um, and it's usually used for the infertility diagnosis. The MRI is better for uterine anomalies, and it offers details views without radiation. So, in brief, the hysterosal pancography checks the tubes and the MRI examines the uterus in detail. So if you are doing a, an uh, ultrasound and you don't see anything, like for you it's normal, uh, it's normal and it doesn't have any abnormalities, you can ask for a hysterosal pancography. But if you see uh, any uterine anomalies, you will ask for an MRI because MRI it's better for diagnosing the for diagnosing the anomalies. And then we will be having the part uh, three. It is the indication and contraindication. So for the indication, of course, it's the infertility. So we primarily do the hysterosal pancography to see the uterine morphology and tubal patency. 
And after that, we have the contraindications. Um, so we have three that you really should remember. We have first, we have the pregnancy. Second, the active pelvic infection. Of course, if a woman has an infection, you will not go and do the, your hysterostatic echography. And the third thing is the recent uterine or tubal surgery. Uh, after that, we'll talk about the technical aspects. So we have two uh, parts in the technical aspects. We have the preparation, so the patient preparation for the history of salpancography, and the technique, the how we do the, the thing. So now we will be talking about the patient preparation for history of salpancography. Uh, here is our first question. So when should hysterosalpancography be performed for optimal visualization? Is it, do we perform it in the luteal phase for the menstrual cycle or the proliferative phase of the menstrual cycle or any time during the menstrual cycle or in the first day of menstruation? You can choose whatever you want. That's good. So we will see what's, when we do it and why. So for the procedure, it should be perf uh, performed during the proliferative phase of the patient's menstrual cycle. So it's in day 6 to 12. And this improves visualization of the uterine cavity and also minimizes the possibility that the patient may be pregnant. So you should do it in the 6th to, uh, to the 12th day. After that, uh, we have the second question. And I think it's an easy one. What is a crucial step before starting hysterosal pancography if there is uncertainty about pregnancy? Will you perform an ultrasound for the patient or administer a beta STG tests or wait for the next menstrual cycle or will you just start the procedure immediately? Mm -hmm. Nice, that's good. For those who want to join them and answer the quizzes, they can just type the menti.com and then use this code so that they can join the other ones. Yeah, that was, that's really good. Yeah, you're right. We should administer a beta SCG test. <clears throat> After that, we'll talk about the technique. So the first thing is the patient position, positioning and preparation. So the patient uh, should be put in the lithotomy position. So this is called the lithotomy position. And of course, uh, we will have the antiseptic cleaning of external genital area. And then uh, the third step is the insertion of a vaginal speculum. And the fourth one is the cleaning of the cervix with an aseptic solution. So uh, in this procedure, the, uh, the, uh, the cleaning with the antiseptic uh, is uh, a really important phase because uh, it's uh, an invasive uh, procedure. So you should be really careful with the infections.
And also the patient is coming to you because she has an, infert an infertility problem. So you shouldn't add another problem to the patient by giving her an infection. And here we will talk about uh, the other steps of the procedure. So we have our second step. Uh, it's the catheterization. So in the catheterization, uh, we have the insertion of a catheter into the cervix. And then um, we inflate the balloon at the end of the catheter to secure its position. Uh, after the catheterization, we have the injection of contrast media. Uh, in, the con in the injection of the contrast media, um, we uh, prime the device to avoid gas bubbles. And then we slowly inject the water-soluble iodinated contrast under fluoroscopy guidance. And the last step is the immersion and evaluation. So uh, in this step, we start with a preliminary frontal view of the pelvis. And then we take spot images to assess uterine contour, fallopian tubes, and contrast spillage. And at the end, we, evalu we evaluate for tubal patency and any abnormalities. Of course, we will see all the steps. This is a recap for the four steps that I told you about. So first, patient positioning and preparation. We talked about the latitomy position and then the catheterization. And after that, the injection of contrast media. And at the end, we have the immersion and evaluation. So here is the preliminary frontal view of the pelvis. <clears throat> so uh, the procedure begins with a pelvic view without preparation, which is an initial frontal x-ray view of the pelvis. And then there is the early filling phase. Um, it's, it's like we inject a small quantity. Well, we don't inject, I'm not a radiologist, but I'm just telling you about the procedure. So in the early filling phase, uh, they inject a small quantity of contrast medium and uh, they do an initial X-ray. It's called the early filling image. And this image is visualized, uh, is, it makes us see the uterine cavity and the initial filling of the fallopian tubes. So here you can see the uterus. And this is the initial filling of the fallopian tubes. <clears throat> and then we have the third phase. It's called the full filling phase. Uh, it's like they inject more contrast uh, and uh, it leads to the full filling image. This phase shows the uterine cavity, fallopian tubes, and peritone peritoneal spillage of the contrast. So here you can see the trajectory of the... And there it's the spilling into the perito peritoneal uh, cavity. Now we have the oblique views. So it's a, sub, a, sub, a subsequent oblique X-rays taken from both right and left angles. It enhances the visualization of the uterine cavity and fallopian tubes. So here we can see, like, see the fallopian tubes more clearly. And then there is the fifth phase. It's called the voiding phase. Uh, or in French, they call it vidange. So here in the voiding phase, so the balloon catheter is deflated because we talked about the balloon catheter. So we talked about how the, in, the, they, they put the, uh, the, uh, ca the catheterization and the, uh, they insert the catheter into the cervix and then they inflate the balloon. But in this step, they deflate the balloon and they allow for the voiding image. Because the the contrast uh, the contrast will be spilled, and uh, we will have the voiding image, and it it will provide us uh, with a view of the isthmus and cervical canal. So 
So here you can see isthmus and cervical canal. And then, yeah, it's the last one. We have the delayed image, or we call it in French l'image uh, tardive, as it is written here. So in this delayed image, uh, it's, uh, it's taken after 20 minutes. It's called a delayed and it's called a delayed image. Uh, so it's primarily taken to check for any remaining contrast in the fallopian tubes. Uh, and it can indicate a possible blockage. Now we arrive to our part five of this presentation and we'll talk about the safety and risks. So this procedure is generally safe, but we can have some risks that includes discomfort, infection, or allergic reaction to the contrast medium. Um, so what is commonly used to reduce pain or discomfort during the hysterosalpancography? Because we talked, we talked here about the the procedure being generally safe with some risk, but we want to prevent those risks, so how? So here we are talking about the pain and discomfort. Will you apply a nice packs to the abdomen? Will you over, uh, do over-the-counter pain medication like NSAIDs or paracetamol? Will you give your patient the antispasmodic medication or do a general anesthesia? Mm -hmm. Just choose whatever answer that seems right for you. Mm -hmm. For people who can't answer here, they can answer in the Google Meet, in the message part, because I can see it. Okay. So we'll see what is the right answer. Yeah, we give them the antispasmodic medication. We can do the general anesthesia because we don't really need it in this uh, procedure. The pain is not uh, a really bad pain that the patient can to can't uh, to tolerate. It's just like a pain that you want to avoid, and you want to because you want to have the best uh, examination and uh, and not cause any harm to your patient. So you will give him the uh, you go, you will give her the antispasmodic medications. And it's given the day before and and then they give her the antispasmodic in the day of the procedure to prevent the pain. <laughs> okay, so now how can the risk of infection be reduced? Will you administer a prophylactic uh, antibiotics or increase the contract, contrast medium or use two catheters instead of one? or perform the procedure without anesthesia. Okay. That's good. 
we have one participant that really loves the word anesthesia. Like they always want to choose the answer that has the anesthesia word in it. <laughs> That's good. So the right answer is administrating the prophylactic antibiotics. <laughs> So now we will dive into the uh, case studies. Now we will have our first case study. So here we see a case of unilateral tubal blockage. So in the described uh, hysterosalpancography image, we observe a complete and proximal obstruction of the right fallopian tube here. Because you can see here, you can see the end and you can see here the peritoneal, uh, the, the contrast passing into the, into the peritoneal cavity. But here it's like it's, it goes, it goes and it stops right here. So we have a complete and proximal obstruction of the right Philippian tube. And this indicates that the contrast medium injected during the procedure is unable to pass through the proximal part of the right tube, suggesting a blockage close to the uterus. It's okay if you can't really understand this, but every, even if you take just small messages from this presentation, it will be really good for you as a medical student. And here we have uh, the second case. So in the hysterosalpancography image, uh, we see a distal obstruction in the right fallopian tube. And uh, so I'll show it to you. So in here, this is the distal obstruction this is the obstruction and we can see here the distension so here we see the distal obstruction of the right fallopian tube with tube dilatation so this is the dilatation so the contrast medium fills the tube but it's blocked near the peritoneal opening this blockage not completely occlusive so this is a non-complete blockage allows minimal contrast spillage into the peritoneal cavity. So as you can see, we have here some spillage into the peritoneal cavity. So, and this is the, 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 the dilatation. <laughs> the dilatation suggests possible fluid accumulation, a condition similar to hydrosalpanks. This partial obstruction is key into, in determining the extent and nature of the tubal pathology. So here, this is the pathological part. So here we saw a complete and proximal obstruction in the right fallopian tube. And here it's an incomplete one. Because we can see here that it goes into the peritoneal cavity. And then, of course, so before our take-home message... I just need to tell you that such radiological findings are essential in diagnosis the precise location and nature of tubal pathology. They help in planning appropriate management, whether it involves surgical intervention or assisted reproductive techniques like in vitro fertilization, especially in cases where natural conception is hindered by these tubal abnormalities. So in brief, it guides them to manage and treat the patient. So it's really important. Uh, this step is really important for the for the cases that has the infertility problem. And of course, now we will end with our take-home message. So the first thing is that the ultrasound is the first line tool. It's a non-invasive tool for fertility assessment. Uh, and second, we have the hysterosalpicography. So it's essential for detecting the fallopian tube blockage. Uh, it's uh, help us determine the cause, the causes of, infer of infertility. And the third thing is MRI. 
So the MRI is superior for identifying uterine anomalies. So lately, they don't do hysterosal pancography for uterine anomalies. The MRI is better, so that's why they use it for the anomalies. The hysterosal pancography, it's, it's essentially for the, for the causes of infertility. So you can see, uh, of course, the hysterosal pancography is the better procedure to see the, the tubes, the fallopian tubes. And of course, together, these tools form a comprehensive approach in evaluating and understanding female reproductive health, each with its unique contribution to gynecological radiology and fertility assessments. And as we conclude, I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to two remarkable mentors who have greatly enriched this presentation with their wisdom and expertise, Dr. Nadia Skali Husseini and Dr. Asma. And of course, our end quotes. <laughs> so enriching our knowledge in the world of medicine not only illuminates the path of healing, but also lights the way to hope for countless lives. Let's continue to learn, innovate, and care with both science and compassion at the heart of all we do. So this is the forum. Of course, it will take you just one minute, and I'll uh, really appreciate your feedback because it really helps me improve. I'll share it with you right here. Mm. Here is it. And I'm really grateful for your attention. You've been awesome. Thank you. Merci beaucoup for